This is Unevenly Distributed, a podcast from nextdevice.com, where we talk to experts to find out what's next in digital technology and where it's real today. This is Unevenly Distributed, the future tech podcast, and I'm Jeff Illamek. And today I'm joined by an expert in many things, including digital healthcare, Charles Drayton of Microsoft. Charles, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to see you again. It's been a little while since I've seen you down in Chicago, where you set up a big healthcare exhibit, among other things. Yeah, it's been, it's been a couple of years. Uh, yeah, a little, over, a little over two years, right? Yeah, yeah, things have been a little bit crazy, as you, as you can imagine. But I want to get down there soon because I know that things have been remodeled and are continuing to, to grow uh, around healthcare and everything. Uh, the Microsoft Technology Centers are amazing. I, I love visiting them anytime I can. But with digital health in mind, digital health, I wanted to get you on for this. It's had a big boost in the past few years. One, because we've needed to be doing so many things remote when possible, and that's been crazy. And that's been a real innovation accelerator everywhere. And two, because new technology is coming online and maturing and making a lot of new things possible. Uh, this Apple Watch, for example, uh, is adding new tech and new sensors into it, like electrocardiogram right into the device. So Charles, considering all this innovation in personal and hospital and pharma, what's your take on the state of digital healthcare right now? I think it's very similar to the state of digital everywhere. The past couple of years have been really hard for all of us. But at the same time, it's created a cultural change in how people engage in the rest of the world. So for example, for years, my mother would refuse to use Amazon or refuse to order anything online. She's just like, I can just get it right now. I'm just going to go across the street to the store and I'm going to get it. And then she couldn't. And so she ordered from Amazon for the very first time. And when she did that and she saw how convenient it was for something to just show up at her door, now, even though she can go across the street to the store, she doesn't want to. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now. It's changed behaviors significantly, and people are now starting to look more to digital channels for things. And yeah, it's definitely true from a retail standpoint, but it's also true from a healthcare standpoint. I think because of the last couple of years, people have been forced to look more at virtual care options. And with the rise of virtual care, people have realized that it's awfully convenient. It's easier for patients because now I don't have to make a long trek to the doctor's office. I don't have to take off of work for two hours to go to the doctor's office. And it's easier for physicians as well because it becomes easier to have a pipeline of patients. And so it became a very effective method of caring for patients. And I think even though, you know, we're sort of on the other side of things, we're still looking at virtual care as being something that's potentially here to stay. And of course, a lot of this is going to be based upon what ends up happening with legislation. I think at state level, a lot of legislation that treated virtual care the same way in terms of reimbursement as in-person care is starting to expire. There's a lot of legislation at the time of our conversation that is trying to extend or renew these protections. And ultimately, we don't know where that's going to go. But I do think that virtual care has become an important quiver that doctors have available to them and it's become very popular as well. And I think, if anything, assuming that we get the right sorts of government cooperation, we're going to see an expansion of virtual care and hybrid care as options. That's really interesting. I didn't consider the legislative aspect of it and the idea that the, the financials and how that drives the dis kinds of decisions we make and what technologies we use in healthcare might be a factor. Yeah, you, you got to remember, a lot of this is based on the fact that these were introduced as emergency measures. So previously, it would become difficult to get patients uh, who were suffering into the hospital. And so you'd get hospitals that were full, you'd have patients who were starting to get better and you'd have to make the decision of, do we keep them in a hospital or do we discharge them sooner? And if we discharge them sooner, how do we monitor them? So when you start, and, and increasingly you also saw scenarios where you would have physicians who themselves would have to be based at home. They'd have to quarantine at home and it'd be a question of, how do I continue caring for patients? How do I continue being productive? 
even though I'm at home. And all this stuff led to the rise of it. Uh, it led to the rise of virtual care options. And a lot of that was supported by the government saying, okay, we're going to treat it like anything else. Um, and because they did, it became easier for hospitals to adopt it. And obviously with things going back to normal, there's now the question of, well, is it really necessary? And I think that's a debate that we're seeing now. I think, as you sort of described, everything that's happened over the past couple of years has really been a trigger and an accelerator. A lot of the trends of moving in this direction in trials with virtual and telemedicine and things like that have been going on for years. The accelerator of pushing things forward, both from the pushing the, the government to make some quick decisions to allow some things to happen, pushing providers to take action to, to put their side in place and start using it. And then us as people, you know, you, you're, you're, you know, your, your family ordering off Amazon and, and things like that. That's been a trigger to push innovation forward. I agree. I would love to see. And I think now that the cat's out of the bag, that's the way that these kinds of things tend to happen. I would love to see that continue. I don't think we'll see the, the rate of change, the acceleration that we did to that forced us into this situation. But the things that are already here, I would expect to continue. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And the other part of that is going to be continued innovation in space. So making the assumption that virtual is here to stay, having means of having a means of making it easy for there to be little differentiation between a virtual experience and an in-person experience is going to be the next logical step. So obviously you have a patient comes to the doctor's office and it's easy for the doctor to say, okay, let me take your blood pressure. Let me take your temperature. Let me take these readings. And now I can make an assessment based upon that. When you're just coming in cold virtually, you don't get that same experience. But what if you did have home devices like your watch that would be able to measure things like your body temperature, your resting heart rate, the number of steps you take, and then start using that as the basis for some sort of vitals assessment that a doctor could use? Well, now you start closing the gap a little bit between coming in to the doctor's office, which has always been the the main objection that the government has had. Like, do you is it the same experience when you're in person right. as it is virtual? We argue no. But in reality, if you start closing the gap with more of these devices, then increasingly the answer becomes yes, it is a comparable experience. And so that's really going to be the next step in ensuring that virtual is here to stay. That's an interesting concept, the idea of, and I, that's the confluence of the devices and the sensors and those kinds of things becoming available. And that's been a long development path as well. I was using probably six, seven years ago, the Cardia device, which had electrocardiogram on a, mm. on a small sensor that you could put on the back of a phone or something. It was, you know, it was about the little bit bigger than a stick of gum. Now having that built into a watch is a step forward. And the these sensors and IoT becoming available and becoming part of all of our everyday devices is one side of it. And then the idea of making that data available in this remote situation and putting it together with just the telemedicine or getting on a call and talking to a doctor on the, on the visit, on the initial visit side is interesting. The other side of it though is how are we gonna use all of this diagnostics and these devices and these sensor sets on the, on the outside, on the outpatient side, on the after the treatment happens, either, either, even after a hospital visit. And I know you've talked to some healthcare providers about that side of it, of how do we monitor what's going on afterwards to keep people healthy and keep those outcomes really uh, going really well? Yeah, the concept of early discharge is something that's really been driving a lot of virtual care. So while Many aspects of the debate is around, well, does it make sense to have an initial visit as virtual and do you get the same sort of care, et cetera? There's also the other aspect of it, which is, does it make sense to keep patients in the hospital as long as we do? And if we think about a lot of hospital-born illnesses and hospital-born complications, a lot of it is generated by patients who are staying in a hospital way too long. It's caused by things like sepsis that might be caused by bed sores, by hospital-borne viruses and illnesses. And so studies have shown that if you can discharge patients faster and you can continue monitoring them, it's, you lead to better outcomes, 
you get fewer complications that take place in hospitals, like pneumonia. You also get better patient satisfaction as well, because patients are happier when they're in their own environment. And the outcomes overall tend to be comparable or superior to the outcomes that you would get if you keep the patient in the hospital. But in order to make that work, you have to have some means of ongoing patient monitoring. And this is where we see things like remote patient monitoring, continuous patient monitoring, and various types of smart devices that can almost take an ICU and bring it to the home. And that's the key thing that you need in order to have comparable levels of outcome. Yeah. And there are advanced uh, sensor packages that you can get. And I've worked with a couple startups at, on uh, basically a kit in a in a sort of a mini briefcase that has a bunch of really advanced sensors, but advanced sensors that are tuned and adapted to our internet connected world, our IoT world. Maybe they're on 5G so that they can be putting their data up into the cloud automatically because you don't want to take uh, a patient, you know, a random patient who's just come out of a traumatic event and say, okay, and now here's how you connect up to your computer and do an upload of blood. <laughs> That's not going to work. So yeah. you need you need those pieces of it too, but those sensor sets are are getting very advanced, and then those use cases of being able to have the data live on either on demand on the doctor's demand or live and continuously streaming up to the the cloud to a doctor in a secure way so that they can look at much more data even than they potentially would have been in a point to point visit or a follow up visit mm -hmm. or checks uh, you know, every hour in the hospital, this continuous flow of data, I think, really becomes important. Yeah, it becomes important, but it becomes dangerous too, right? So I remember before I would have conversations with physicians about this, and I'd be met with a, a collective eye roll. It's like, great, last thing I need is even more data. I already hate my right. EMR. <laughs> and, and now you want me to have more technology and more data? And so there's a lot of pushback against that, and rightfully so. Physicians are facing a lot of burnout right now. And a lot of that is driven by all of the non-clinical things you have to do. And then the fact that you now have to update your EMR, you now have to do all of your coding, you have to do all the billing information, and now it's taking up all this time, and your reimbursement has shrunk, and your RBUs have gone up, and therefore your margins are much lower, and it's become a real hassle. So I say all that to say what you want to be careful of is not inundating your physicians with more data, more things that require them to continuously sort through a whole bunch of patient metrics. What you want to do instead is identify key trends. So that is to say, rather than, than spamming your EMR with countless numbers of, of blood pressure reading from you know every minute from continuous patient monitoring or something like that to instead say, okay, day over day or hour over hour, what are we looking at in terms of variation? Are we stable? Have we gone below a threshold? Have we gone above a threshold? How often has that happened? And what do you need to know in order to make the right sort of assessment? So that's going to be the important thing. And that's that, that's that tightrope that we have to walk a little bit. We want to be helpful. But it's not always more data that is the most helpful thing. It's trying to spot the trends yeah. that really becomes the most helpful thing for physicians. I can definitely sympathize with that. Bigger and bigger data sets is interesting, but it's interesting from a data science perspective. Mm -hmm. And this does get to, and then maybe this is a good segue to, to talk about another area, which I think is interesting in healthcare. My favorite tool for looking at big data sets uh, these days is artificial intelligence, machine learning models. How mm -hmm. can we take those and have those be a partner to the doctor to identify these trends and look for triggers and look for events or pre even just presenting information in an interesting way to a doctor so that at a glance they can get information and not data. The difference between data and information, you know, data, I, I don't need a, a spreadsheet with 10,000 entries over the course of the past 24 hours. There's nothing I can do with that. <laughs> um, but if you have data on a dashboard that says, here are yeah. the three things that you want to know, and you can drill in and you can get, as a doctor, you can get deeper if you need to. This isn't taking anything away from the doctor being able to do that if they would like to and digging in where they need and want, being a partner to them in that. 
putting those models in place though to be that partner i think is is uh, that that's what i think is a way to solve it <laughs> what, what do you think is a way to solve it yeah i i've been in healthcare for uh, a good long time but prior to being in healthcare i was in the legal field and i was in a legal field at during the dawn of something called predictive coding and predictive coding is this concept in in litigation software where you're using artificial intelligence to sort through data sets in order to identify, for example, documents that might be responsive. That is to say, potentially evidence that could be used in a case. And it became increasingly important when you started looking at data sets that were that would be subject to some sort of litigation. So, for example, it's no longer like in the old days where you would have you know a couple of legal briefings somewhere and they'd all be in paper. Now you can be now you can discuss legal stuff over email. How many emails does the average organization have, right? Millions. It can be done in Word documents. How many Word documents does your average organization have? Millions. So the idea of hiring lawyers to literally go through and read these documents uh, is not realistic. So it started using different types of litigation technology that used AI that would essentially look at examples of what a law firm is looking for as evidence and then automatically find things that were conceptually similar to it that might also be evident. And it really became the de facto way of looking for evidence in a case when you're dealing with terabytes of information that might potentially be responsive. But the problem with that was, oh, it was subject to a lot of legal challenges where they would say, it's a computer. It's not a person. A computer cannot be a lawyer. It really took quite a bit of litigation before courts in the Southern District of New York eventually said, you can use predictive coding or technology-assisted review as a means of going through a, a case and trying to find documents. So what does that have to do with healthcare? Um, that set the model in a lot of ways for how we talk about AI and large data sets and helping people. The goal around technology assisted review or predictive coding was not for computers to find the evidence, it's for computers to help people find the evidence. Yes. By going through and saying, all right, here are all the documents that have absolutely nothing to do with the case. Well, we're gonna put them to the side. Here are some documents that may have something to do with the case, and now it's a much smaller set because 99% of documents are completely irrelevant. Here's that 1% that might be relevant. And now I'm going to, instead of hiding it from you, I'm going to sort it. Say, here are the things yeah. that we think are most likely to be relevant to the case. Read this document first. And now it's up to you as a person to say, okay, yes, I'm going to put this in the evidence pile, evidence pile, not evidence pile, not evidence pile, while continuing to train the system to say, okay, Knowing what we know that you think this is evidence, here are some additional documents that we think is evidence. Here are some additional documents we think is not evidence. Again, how does this relate to healthcare? The same general principles. So we're not looking at replacing physicians. And let's look at radiology for a second. We're not looking at replacing a radiologist with a human to identify brain cancer or to identify tumors or anything else. Instead, we're using it to say, hey, radiologists, Here's what we found. Do you concur, doctor? And allowing the radiologist to say, ah, that's interesting. I hadn't seen that. Or yeah, I've seen that as well. We agree. So it becomes a nice way, not of replacing a radiologist, but of amplifying the radiologist. And if we look at it you know, more broadly as well, this idea of having AI have it be able to be trained on millions of medical journals to be able to look at all of this and say, not here's what it is, but here's what it's likely to be, and here's what it's definitely not. We refer to that as differential diagnostics, and it really becomes a way of amplifying the physician's ability to make decisions. That's, that's excellent. And it gets to a point of confusion, I think, that people have that aren't familiar with the way machine learning works. Machine learning doesn't come up with answers. It doesn't tell you the answer. What it does is most the way most machine learning works is it looks at a, at a set of data and then it finds fitness of data to a particular model. And that fitness of the data to the model is a percentage of likelihood in most cases. So right. as you say, it's looking at the, the data or the triggers or the situation of the health, the, the health triggers or a document and saying, 
This looks like something that might be evidence. And here's the percentage of likelihood that the model thinks it might be evidence. Yes. That exactly. is, is a great tool then, as you say, to sort and highlight and focus my limited attention instead of on the billion pieces of potential evidence and having to have humans look at with their eyeballs at every single piece of, of every single one, but point those eyeballs in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I think the other thing we need to do, and this, this, a lot of this conversation, and I'm surprised it keeps coming and I'm surprised and then I'm not surprised when I think about it, because this is the way it goes is coming back to legislation and regulation. Uh, the, idea of should we be afraid of artificial intelligence making decisions on our behalf because we know that there can be errors but mm. that's inherent to the to the system the model it's it's only you know 92 percent sure that this is a tumor it's not saying we know it's a tumor and it never will that right. that idea then i think we need to be careful from a regulatory perspective and and a, as we learn more hopefully the government will catch up and regulatory will catch up to not say, well, it could make a wrong decision. So mm -hmm. we need to throw it out because, yeah. yeah, because eyeballs are very bad and eyeballs can make wrong decisions as well. <laughs> and eyeballs yeah, can be biased and, <laughs> and have problems. Yeah. There's a little bit of dark humor in radiology that I hear where they say radiologists are just a little bit better in the beginning of their shift than at the end of their shift. So if you're a patient, uh, it's probably better to be the first image they see instead of the last. Um, hopefully, that's not that's not entirely true, but it's definitely something that that is a real factor in human nature. So having a second set of eyes, or as uh, nuance likes to call it, the doctor's doctor, there to say, yeah. "Oh, let's make sure you didn't miss this." I think is a key part in in really optimizing what the physician's experience is. I've got this article from Radiology Today, which for some reason popped back up in the news, but is an old story from 2013 where radiologists, they did a bunch of these studies on radiologists and their attention span. And one of the ways they tested it was by putting up uh, radiology photos of lungs looking for tumors. And then amongst this tumor set of people that weren't told what they were going to be seeing, they were looking for a particular type of tumor. In some of the frames of the x-rays, they were putting a picture of a gorilla, uh, like a outline of a gorilla, uh, just, you know, like, like somewhere in, in, the, in the photo. And they were trying to determine uh, the, which of the radiologists picked it up and which ones didn't. This, the summary was a lot of them missed it. A lot of them did not mm -hmm. see it. Um, but a corollary, another part of it, which we should be, <laughs> which is where we should be happy is the the error rate of radiologists when they're looking for tumors is very, very low. They're right mm -hmm. almost all of the time and, and they don't miss many cases. So if you look across, uh, across what they're looking at. Yeah, I think that's an important point because this isn't like any sort of indictment of radiologists. I've sold this technology no. to radiologists and, and I think originally people would say, oh, you're going to make radiologists nervous. They love it. They absolutely love this stuff. And the reason why is because, and, and one radiologist told me, so like I'll, I'll quote, and he said, listen, a lot of times people think that all we do in radiology is look at images. That's the least interesting thing that we do. When I'm happiest, it's when I'm part of a care team, when I'm making strategic decisions, when I'm you know, in the room and I am helping to determine a course of care. That's the interesting thing about my job. Sitting there looking at image after image, not very interesting. So if I can either offload or hasten the, that part of what I do, and if you have technology that can support that, I'm all in. And that's why radiology has become really one of the, one of the leading departments in healthcare to start adopting a lot of this tech. Yeah. You, when we talked last, had a... A good corollary to this as well in understanding that combination of humans plus AI being really interesting, and it was the model around chess. Why don't you explain that? And then we can sort of use that as the capstone to this AI discussion. Yeah. So, so funny story. Everyone knows about like Deep Blue just destroying humans and, and these chess computers absolutely demolishing human opponents, even grandmasters. And a little known thing started happening somewhere around the early 2000s, where 
people started to understand a little bit more about how these chess programs worked. And so they started using these anti-computer moves. So things that would seem completely illogical and random, which would throw the computer off because computers, at the end of the day, even AI, they're not smart, they're powerful. So they are able to run billions of calculations much faster than any human could do in a lifetime. So it's very much, even, even the smart ones are very much about brute force at its core. So if you're able to do things that can throw it off and confuse it, it'll start making all kinds of crazy errors. So what they started doing was adopting these anti-computer strategies that would just throw the computer completely off its game. And then you'd be able to kind of take advantage of the chaos and win. So that started have, becoming a thing. And then it became a little bit of this arms race between chess computer programmers and human chess players where you try and you try and patch the bugs that they would exploit. And then you try and get around that and get around that. So what ended up happening was we started looking at these hybrid scenarios where you would have these human computer chess teams that would compete against purely computer chess teams. And the human computer chess teams would actually win against these against purely computerized chess. And it's because it was able to use a combination of human intuition and creativity with the raw brain power that you get with a computer. And I think that became a really interesting example of a model that, you're, that you would see throughout AI, where you're not using AI to replace people, but you're using it to augment people. You're using it to supplement people with the best types of insights that they need in order to make, in order to use their own intuition, their own expertise, their own experience to decide what the next best course of action is going to be for them. That human plus AI hybrid is a model that we've talked about in many industries and gets us over this question of, is, is the artificial intelligence going to replace the X? Is it going to replace the lawyer? Is it going to replace the doctor? Is it going to replace the, the, the taxi driver? Maybe, maybe in that one, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe in a couple <laughs> cases, but, but, but no, in most of the cases, what it's doing mm. is it's a partner to the human and that hybrid model of human plus AI being greater than the sum of the parts is where this things, these things get really interesting. Yeah. The other absolutely. part of it, which I think it, it, everybody who understands AI deeply, well, most people who understand AI deeply, some people who understand AI very deeply have gone off the deep end uh, around is AI intelligent these days. Uh, but most people who understand machine learning models is there is no actual intelligence there. It's the ability to take a huge data set and through a multi-dimensional model of numbers of basically layers of spreadsheets, put together a, a, a model of math, linear algebra, to help us figure out where we're seeing patterns and pieces of patterns and how they match up and to create a whole and give us that percentage likelihood number to answer a particular question. There's no actual intelligence going on there. So the other thing that we need to understand with AI is AI models does, are designed to answer a specific narrow question and they don't step, they, they, they can't step outside of that box unless you build mm -hmm. either another model or a bigger model or a different model. Right. So the other thing we'll probably end up getting is a bunch of models, a bunch of models that all work in concert. And again, are the partner to me as the doctor. Yeah, I agree. A, a lot of, and you're starting to see some investments in areas like the ICU with organizations like Baxter, uh, who's a Microsoft partner. And Baxter made a lot of strategic acquisitions around this to be able to say, I want to be able to make the ICU smarter. So what do I need in order to make the right types of assessments? That's all human driven, right? So it's being able to say, what is the likelihood that this patient's ready for discharge? What is the likelihood that the patient is going to deteriorate over the next hour? What is the likelihood that based upon these vitals readings that that there's going to be some sort of crash that's there and therefore he's going to need more frequent rounding. These are all things where you, you can't just have one AI system that looks at all of that, but you're looking at different sets of data and then different systems all working in concert with each other in order to give its best guess 
that can be used by care teams to determine what the course of action is going to be. Again, like you said, it's not making a decision for the care team, but it's giving some informed insights the care team can use to say, okay, we're going to use this in order to triage the patient and say, we need to check in on them every 10 minutes, as opposed to every half hour for another patient where perhaps it's not going to be as critical to continuously check in on them. Yeah. I, I think that's super important of putting a bunch of those different systems together and making that constellation of intelligent models and intelligent tools and sensors and technology a a, a broader tool set that interacts with the people and making the people more uh, effective. One of the ways <laughs> so I've, I've worked with a lot of healthcare providers, uh, and this goes back to probably one of my biggest uh, uh, situations where we're working with a healthcare provider. Uh, we did a an innovation workshop with Ascension Health, and Ascension Health came to us and they said, "We want to talk about innovation. We want to talk about digital tools." And, and we start talking about sensors and AI, and 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 they looked at us and they said, "We'd love to do that. That sounds great. That sounds excellent." But my biggest problem is I can't talk to the doctor that's in the offices down the hall because we can't communicate. Our email systems, our our communication systems are terrible. You just <laughs> Can we start there? Can we start just being able to talk to each other? Uh, that did evolve into a, a public reference, uh, Ascension Health, building on Microsoft Teams, a collaboration tool set to be able to have a, 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 the ability to, to communicate and take one of their key collaboration situations, which is a tumor board, which is where a bunch of doctors of the dis different disciplines get together and review cases. They put it all into one place in Microsoft Teams, and this was, again, this was in the before times, but allowed them to do this remotely, allowed the, them to do this in a disconnected mm -hmm. state, plugged in the radiology system and the diagnostic system and all of the notes that were coming in for the lab, all in one place so that they could just collaborate as humans. So I know Microsoft is invested in this space and we were doing it on Microsoft Tech at that time. Yeah, I know Microsoft I has made some but made some purchases even even lately around communication and doctors communicating and and taking some of that load off communication. Why don't we get into that and give me your initial thoughts on that? And then I want to talk about nuance in, in particular. Yeah, care coordination is a really big piece of the puzzle overall. I think we've gotten to a point now where there isn't just one person making a decision. It's a team-based decision. There's going to be your physician. There's going to be your specialist, so cardiologist, radiologist. There's going to be you as a patient. There may even be people who are part of your family group. You might have a home care worker. You might have a child or a parent who is going to be responsible for you. And it really, in order to drive the best possible outcomes, it really requires coordination between all of them. And it's difficult, and it's been difficult to do historically because of the fact that many times your care plan would be something that was written down and you just mm -hmm. hand it to the patient and the patient would lose it or they wouldn't listen to it or there'd be no way of really getting insight into what the patient is doing. And so it really requires that sort of, as we refer to continuity of care to say, I've gone from primary to specialty, tertiary care, back to primary care, back to home care, and to be able to do that in a seamless manner. Doing, being able to pull that off does require a good amount of collaboration. And that's historically been something that's difficult when you're dealing with organizations that are disconnected. And in many cases, your primary care physician doesn't necessarily work for the hospital where your cardiologist is and might have admitting privileges, but they don't work there. So we've made a concerted effort to provide the types of tools necessary to make it easy for people from a diverse array of, of backgrounds and a diverse array of organizations they work for to still come together ultimately and say, here's how we're going to drive towards better outcomes for the patient. That makes a lot of sense. And your step beyond there, bringing the patient into that communication and collaboration picture, I think is key and something that we didn't have as part of the Ascension Health. That was a particular situation with the tumor board. But the patient being part of that collaboration uh, situation help maybe maybe ultimately even helping determine what the best care plan might be because it's what fits into their lifestyle and their schedule and what their home situation might be is key. 
Another area which you suggest is this care plan. Yeah, you give it to the patient. You could say even the simple care plan of here's your medicine, go to the pharmacy. You're supposed to take it twice a day. That is a is a complicated thing for many people and for many patients. It's just complicated for for any of us in our lives. I've heard of a few really interesting innovation concepts that are trying to bring in more collaboration tools, more modern collaboration tools into that picture to make that easier for patients. And one of them was uh, social networks and, and social tools. Uh, the simplest being SMS, text messaging. What if, what if you had some text message reminders twice a day when the person's supposed to be taking their medicine that pop up? So even if you lose your care plan, your, mm -hmm. your phone is reminding you because those text messages are flowing. Those studies that have started to do that and bring the, the patient into a digital care system have much, much better outcomes than ones that just give them a piece of paper that says, hey, you know, twice a day. Oh, did you throw away the bag that the, that mm -hmm. the, the pills happen to be in? Well, now, you're, now you have no idea when you're supposed to be taking these pills. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the <clears throat> real key tenets of the Microsoft Cloud for Health. I've been avoiding talking product too much, but I think yeah. now I am. And this um, goes... So yeah, I mean, it goes around, it goes around everywhere, but the, the tenants, yeah. the technology underneath it, I think is what Microsoft's doing really well in bring, bringing mm -hmm. together these best of field pieces. So sure, talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The cloud for healthcare is really designed to do exactly that. A lot of times, so, so some of the biggest concern that we, that we get from physicians sometimes is, are all of these technologies you're introducing going to make my life more complicated? Do I now have to become an expert, not only in my EMR, but I have to become an expert in Teams, I have to become an expert in Microsoft Dynamics, I have to become an expert in Azure stuff. Do I have to now go into Power BI and look at things? And the answer is no, and not necessarily. In many respects, a lot of this is designed as a behind the scenes orchestration system. I'll give you an example. You talked a little bit about SMS follow-ups. A lot of this can be done through a patient engagement platform, similar to what we have with Microsoft Dynamics. And that's part of the cloud for healthcare, where you have these, these different types of templates that might be focused on patient engagement. So patient engagement might be, hey, it's time for your flu shot. Or, hey, you've now turned 45, it's time for your colonoscopy. Or, hey, based upon the latest gene study that we did for you, you are at higher risk of breast cancer. So let's get you in and, and do an exam or post-discharge or, or post-visit saying, hey, did you, get a, did you refill your prescription? You haven't gotten a refill in the last 30 days for 30 day prescriptions, it's been 45 days. Um, is there anything that we can do? So using these types of technologies behind the scenes, that doesn't actually require any doctor intervention. The only right. time physicians ever get involved would be any event that it rose to the alert level. So you would have some sort of automated thing saying, hey, your blood pressure's up, you know, let's, let's keep taking your blood pressure medication or your A1C level has skyrocketed, you know, let's lay off the sugar a little bit. And you know, here are certain things that you can do to manage it, leafy green vegetables, that sort of thing. And then using the automation wherever possible until it gets to a point where there's some sort of consistent trend that requires more direct provider intervention. And I think that is actually something that helps, that helps lessen the burden on physicians while still providing yeah. that sort of continuous care. Right. The, the system, again, becomes a partner to the doctor and takes care of some things that the doctor doesn't need to. And the most intelligent systems, yes, they do that without having to have the doctor or the care team have to be educated in you know, Power BI. We don't want... <laughs> we don't want yeah, and don't that's want all that part of what we refer to as omni-channel, right? So omni-channel yeah. would be what channel makes the most sense for a patient. And maybe that channel is an SMS, as you, as you said. Maybe that channel is some sort of chat bot. Maybe it's an email. Maybe it's an automated phone call if you're dealing with patients who don't necessarily have access to a different type of internet technology. Or maybe it's a prompt for the physician to call up the patient and say, hey, we noticed a consistent increase in your A1C. I want to talk to you about this for a second. So Omnichannel can be really anything. And it's a really great way of helping to bridge the gap when it comes to health equity. Something we haven't really talked about yet 
but I think it is an important topic. So when you're dealing with people who don't necessarily have internet connectivity, they don't have broadband, have all kinds of you know different home monitoring devices, how can we still how can we still reach them? And I think being able to include within omnichannel low technology means is something that's key as well, as well as different types of hybrid scenarios that maybe we have time to talk about, maybe we don't. But you know, hybrid essentially is how do we bring the hospital to the patient's home or to their locality where they're still able to connect to a physician who might be remote without necessarily having to have a whole broadband set up at home because not everyone does. That idea of the right channel at the right time and this uh, opportunity to go after the channels that can reach whatever patient in whatever scenario, I think that's really important. And for anyone who's cross industry or works in the other, other industry, banking. I talked to Michelle Baxter a couple mm-hmm. episodes ago about banking. I talk a lot about retail. A lot of these terms are, are cross industry or maybe came from other industries. The idea of omni-channel, you know, pr- predictive uh, offers in omni-channel, that's a retail scenario. That's the idea of what, what can we get to the, to the right customer at the right time. Um, and the channels in that situation are where is that communication mechanism that we can get to this this particular customer or patient or you know or or banking associate? Um, I mm-hmm. that's that's excellent. And you're yeah, we we borrow a lot of that from retail. Yeah. Um, so we think of that as the as the uh, what do they call it? Like the consumerization of healthcare. Uh, so looking at these retail patterns and saying, hey, a lot of the things that drive buying decisions can drive health decisions. And in many cases, buying decisions and health decisions are one and the same. So if we can influence someone to buy more leafy greens because they have elevated A1C, they're pre-diabetic, and less candy, then that itself is a win. So we can take lessons from retail to try and influence consumer behavior I mean, it actually drives health outcomes downstream. We're talking a lot about communication, and there's something I wanted to get to in communication uh, in particular. Uh, when doctors communicate, the, there's the, the old meme, and it, it seems to be true, of doctors have a problem with, with uh, writing from, from time to time. Their handwriting is, is terrible, and, and they have to do I'm a lot of it. I'm not one of the judge. <laughs> you should see my handwriting. Right, right, so am I. And they have to do a lot of it, uh, and they yeah. have to do a lot of this as you were talking about the time that they spend in EMR and entering data into the EMR is extreme. And they're, they're spending a, almost a majority of their time or the biggest percentage of the pie chart of what time they spend is entering data into these systems or getting data out of these systems. And that's not where their expertise and their time should be spent. Um, why don't you talk for just a couple of minutes? Cause I love the idea of where this can go and some of the, some of the future of nuance and what nuance does and how that sort of helps with this. If you're in healthcare, you're, you probably already heard of the quadruple aim, previously triple aim. And so the quadruple aim is uh, how do you improve outcomes for the individual patient? How do you improve outcomes for the population as a whole? How do you cut cost? And those are the original three. And then people at some point realize that there is something missing. Uh, so how do you address physician burnout? That is to say, how do you optimize the clinician experience? So that is your quadruple aim. And so even though a lot of what organizations had initially focused on were those first three, patient engagement and, you know, and, and care coordination and all that, and population health and all of that, there's been a lot of focus now on how do you improve the clinician experience? There is a significant issue with clinician burnout. And by clinician, I mean not just physicians, but nurses, pretty much all clinical staff. Yeah. Where where organizations are understaffed right now, they're losing people at a higher rate. There's actually an elevated suicide rate among clinicians as well, and it's only accelerated in the past couple of years. And so it's reached virtual crisis levels, and I think the last couple of years has really started to expose that. So one of the things that we've been looking at now is how do we use technology not to burden clinicians, but to alleviate the burden? And a big part of solving for that is through things like automating a lot of the administrative work that clinicians have previously been responsible for. So how do you automate coding and billing and note taking and all of these different other factors? This is where nuance comes into play. And as you may or may not know, 
Microsoft acquired Nuance fairly recently. Nuance is known for like Dragon, which is that voice dictation technology that's been around for forever. But now it's all AI powered. So now imagine being a physician and you are having a conversation with a patient instead of having your face in the screen and typing and typing and typing and trying to do your coding while you're talking to the patient, which is a common thing, to instead talk to you, like look your patient in the eye, talk to your patient and then have something in the background doing a lot of that ambient note taking, looking at the conversation between the physician and the patient saying, you know, here is some aspect of the patient's history that is going to be relevant to this conversation, then being able to organize everything into your soap notes or your physician's notes and essentially prepare it to very easily push back into the EMR. So as a physician, your post-engagement wrap-up is much shorter. You basically review everything, give it the thumbs up, and now you're done. You can move on to the next patient. That's going to be, I believe, where things are going to be going over the next couple of years, using technology not to burden clinicians, which has historically not been the case, and to instead alleviate through various types of automation. Which is wonderful, because then, as you just just, just described, not only is the doctor's day better, because they've got this easier workflow and it's taking some of that burden of the complicated system off the table, but the patient experience is better. So the patient gets to talk to their doctor and the doctor gets to talk to their patient. And then from that will flow better outcomes as well, because now the doctor is present in the moment and isn't going to miss, even though it's only the the 1% or the 2% where maybe they they missed some sort of symptom or something that that could make the experience slightly better. And that's a big focus of mine. Uh, I'm currently with the chief product office. And a lot of what we're focusing on now is where nuance and its AI capabilities can enhance all the different things that we have as part of the Microsoft platform. And that's something that we've been taking a really, really big look at. So you're going to be excited to see a lot of things that we release when it's all going to be driven more by some of the uh, AI capabilities that nuance has and the clinical insights that nuance has. Okay. Well, I think with that tease, I think it's a good opportunity to pause our conversation for today and book the next conversation from, you know, for six months from now or, or eight months from now when we can get into what some of those futures are. Maybe get into more of that Horizon 2, Horizon 3. What are things going to look like 10 years from now? So let's use that as our, our teaser. Charles, it's always awesome talking to you. This has been an amazing conversation. I love really thinking about making people's lives better. And healthcare is such a wonderful industry and a wonderful situation to, to do that in a really tactical way. Uh, a a way you can really feel the outcomes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure being on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. And we will talk again soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jeff. This has been a Nexavise production. For video links and to support the show, please visit nexavise.com. That's N-E-X-A-V-I-S-E dot com.